Welcome to Trialside News Podcast Series. Today, we are honored to have Negan Hajizadeh, who will be discussing Feinstein Institute's researchers finding an effective COVID-19 cytokine storm treatment and more. Now, Negan is an ICU pulmonologist and was a part of North Wales Health, New York's largest health system at the height of the surge. Now, she has experienced and delivered care firsthand. She is also a researcher with the Feinstein Institute. So, Negan, welcome. Thanks. Nice to be here. The pleasure is ours. So can you share with us a little bit about yourself? I'd like our audience to get to know you. Uh, what got you interested in medicine early on and what propelled you through schooling and extensive residency and medical work to get you where you are today? Wow, that's, that's, a, that's a big question. What got me into medical school is I think what gets most people into medical school that is wanting to do good and wanting to serve others and heal. I think the practice of healing is a really attractive and privileged uh, practice. Uh, that's why I started on this path. Um, critical care was very interesting to me because it's really internal medicine at the most extreme. You need to know internal medicine in its most severe form and the most severe uh, acute flares of internal medicine diseases. So I uh, pursued cr critical care and pulmonary medicine. Lungs are very fascinating to me that you need to be able to breathe and it's the core of life. Although we argue with the cardiologists, whether it's the heart or the lung, the pulmonologist thinks it's the lung. Um, <laughs> that's the most important organ. Um, and I then started a path of research because I realized that status quo needed to be improved and the most powerful method of improvement is through research, like really looking at the data, understanding, analyzing, and informing the decisions we make as doctors, as clinicians, as well as patients and families with data that gets updated iteratively over time as we learn more and more about medicine and what works and what doesn't work. So as most of our audience knows, Trial Site News tries to make research more accessible and transparent. That's our mission and our goal. We have noticed that during the pandemic, there has been an, an enormous number of clinical trials dealing with various aspects of COVID-19. However, we have observed that there really aren't any therapies that we have found that work addressing early state onset of the disease. Why do you think this is the case? I think the most challenging aspect of research, in particular clinical trials, is getting the patient population that you test something in right. So by that, I mean, there's a lot of heterogeneity. When you have different forms of a disease, it's often hard to find one single effect with one pill or one treatment. This is where we talk about personalized medicine and tailoring what you do for the individual person. I'm really talking about targeting different groups within a disease. So COVID-19 has many different presentations. Yes, the most common cause, the most common symptom is shortness of breath and coughing, but there are many other different forms of it. There's there are those who have very high fevers, there are those who don't have very high fevers. So on first glance, even COVID-19 is a heterogeneous disease. It depends on who you are and it depends what your symptoms are with the disease. I think that's one problem in that we continue to do clinical trials. That's a one size fits all one pill for everybody. And it's really hard to find one treatment that works for everybody. So we need trials that are designed that we call are enriched for those, for example, who have the highest risk of doing worse with COVID-19, those who have hypertension and the comorbidities and who are from racial and ethnic minority backgrounds, for example. That would increase your likelihood of seeing a potential effect. The other thing is that most people with COVID-19 don't end up becoming severely ill and needing to be hospitalized. And so you require a very, very large sample size to try to show that the needle is moved when you have such a small proportion of people who get severely ill. So the, the other important aspect of clinical trials is what your outcome is going to be. What are you testing to see a change in? Is it a change in severity of symptoms? Is it a change in mortality? Is it a change in hospitalization? That also is a problem with several of these clinical study designs. Now, I wanna to talk to you about the recent study that you led that focused on patients that faced uh, with a cytokine storm, obviously a deadly situation. Can you share with the audience 
What are the theories of COVID-19? Why is there such a violent response in the immune system due to this virus? I will start off by saying I'm not a virologist. I'm not an immunologist. I'm a pulmonologist and a critical care doc. And I have read the, 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 the data and worked closely with, with rheumatologists and immunologists to try to understand our immune system response. My understanding is that in particular with COVID-19, this is a virus that our systems has not seen, uh, SARS-2, SARS-CoV-2. As a consequence, we have an exaggerated immune response to a virus that our immune systems have not had a chance to generate any sort of immunity to. And that in those people who have this particular exuberant response with extremely high fevers, and with markers of inflammation that are very, very elevated. In the attempt to fight off the virus, this turns out to become almost autoimmune in fighting one's own system. Um, and that's causing a lot of the problem as, as opposed to just the virus itself attacking cells, the problem is exacerbated by the immune system trying to attack the virus and then inadvertently attacking the body itself. So that early on, when, when colleagues were seeing this hyperinflammatory condition with very high fevers, and what we see in the ICU is the body is almost uh, as if it's in a crazed state. We see heart rate very elevated. We see blood pressure very, very elevated, fever curves that we have not seen before a very difficult time sedating the patient with multiple different types of sedatives that we have never seen or had to use before. So a body in an extreme hyper state, um, the thought was, can we try to quell that immune response in the way that it's been done for other diseases with something like an anti-interleukin-1 uh, or anti-interleukin-6, which is in the pathway of immune response. That was very early on the thought which triggered very small numbers of people in whom this was tested, not controlled, not randomized, just case studies, which seemed to show that the immune system was quelled and maybe in parallel or associated with or caused by, we don't know, outcomes seem to have been improved. And that was the premise behind many of the studies, including the recovery trial with the steroids, all focused on quelling the immune system, allowing the body to do what it needed to do to fight off the virus, but giving it a little bit of a check in how exuberant it was. Now, what is the relationship to pulmonary and the lung system? So pulmonology is the term we use for the lungs, uh, and it covers uh, all, any, 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 uh, disease that affects the lungs. In COVID-19, the organ that is most often and most prominently affected is the lung, the pulmonary system. Now, let's shift a bit. I want to talk about minorities and African-Americans here. Now, we know that African-Americans uh, are dying as much as twice the rate of whites, and other minorities face more risk as as may those with comorbidities. Can you share your theory as to why this is possibly happening? That's, it's, it's a really interesting question. It's been, obviously it's concerning that, um, that people in our, in, our, uh, in our city, in particular in New York City, where I practice, uh, who are from uh, black and brown communities seem to be disproportionately, are not seem to, are disproportionately affected by COVID-19. And by that, I mean that there are higher rates of infection, but also that those who get infected get sicker. And it's been attributed to the association between them having more of the comorbidities that we know are associated with worse outcome, like hypertension and diabetes and some of the lung diseases. To me, it's been curious though, when we take models and we control for two people or groups of people who have these other comorbidities, we still see that in black and brown patients, there is a higher proportion 
who are more severely ill. So I don't think it's surely explained by comorbidities. I think there's more to the story, um, whether it's genetic factors or whether it's epigenetics. So the environment in which one lives associating with genetic factors, I don't know. But I, I would challenge us as a research community not to sit back and say, this is all social determinants of health causing worse comorbidity burden to think more about it, to think more deeply about genetic associations and epigenetics in why um, black and brown communities get sicker. Certainly the infectivity has to do at least in New York City with socioeconomic barriers to things like being able to remove yourself from the household when you have a household with multiple people living in it or working in the service industry predominantly where you're exposed to sick people. I can understand the infectivity explained by social determinants of health and socioeconomic status and work. I can't fully understand why the black and brown patients, many of them get sicker than uh, similarly, at least on the face, uh, white patients. Now, I'm going to talk about the recovery trial uh, and, and more. Now, we know from covering trials that the recovery trial was the first to evidence some potential for patients in deep trouble with extensive uh, issues associated with COVID-19. There are the dexamethasone, a corticosteroid, turned out to work and now is a recommended drug. Why do you think this common drug works? For the same reason as I mentioned before, which is the quelling of the immune system, calming down the immune system. Um, I will also note though, that early on in the disease, we were cautioned by several prominent acute lung injury, acute respiratory distress syndrome researchers about the use of steroids. Because in the ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome literature, there are subsets of patients who do worse when they're given steroids. I am concerned that we are yet again using a one size fits all treatment. And it remains to be seen, and I certainly hope to be able to shed some light on whether there are some groups of people in whom steroids should not be used. That is an area, again, we can't sit back comfortably saying it works for everybody. Right. Uh, we need to investigate that. We need to explore that. But that's the mechanism in which it's theorized to work, which is quelling the immune system so that that autoimmune feature where it's attacking your own body is calmed down while the body fights off the virus. Now, you were recently involved in a retrospective study that caught our interest. Uh, in a study involving nearly 6,000 patients, researchers from Feinstein Institutes for Medical Research and Northwell COVID-19 Research Consortium, can you describe for the audience a retrospective study and how that differs from a randomized controlled trial? Yeah, sure. Again, I, this is, it's very nice to be able to do this because there's no point in doing research if people don't understand it. We're not trying to create silos of researchers talking to each other. So I appreciate this opportunity and I'll try to explain it the best I can. In the realm of science, a randomized controlled trial is the gold standard. That is hailed as the best way of seeing whether A causes B. And the reason that is, is because you can randomize people. If, if you have a large enough sample size, I can't stress that enough. If you have a large enough number of people and you randomize them into one group versus the other, then things we call confounders that could influence the outcome you see are equally spread out in group one versus group two. So that if you see group one does better than group two with the pill, you can say it's less likely because of all this other stuff, the confounders, and really because of the pill you gave. That's the beauty of a randomized controlled study, which requires a very large sample size because that allows you to overcome that heterogeneity, that difference in groups that you might see. A retrospective study is a form of an observational trial, which means you don't allocate people into any group. You look at the data based on the natural distribution of people in whichever group. It's been cautioned against because in several historical studies, people thought 
that A caused the good outcome, but it was all these not measure and look okay, at goal for. So take away those, the noise that ponders were anything on the outcome. We've been cautioned against using observational studies because you can't control for all of these other influencers on the outcome, what we call confounders. So it could be that in group one, there were more men than in group two. I mean, those are obvious ones we control for, but there might be other things that we don't know to control for. Let's say zip code or something that I didn't know to try to make similar in my analysis that actually was the thing that caused the effect and not the drug. So uh, we're very much cautioned against making any assumption about cause from an observational study. If we are as scientists talking about cause and effect, we are told that we can only use a randomized controlled study to say that. Okay. Now, retrospective just means we looked back using historical data as opposed to prospective observational. It's an observational study. The reason we chose to do this knowing the limitations of an observational study is that we had close to 6,000 patients. That is a lot of people. And furthermore, we had um, what we call a natural experiment situation where the health system instituted a protocol that said, if you have the following inflammatory markers, LDH, D-dimer, CRP, that are elevated, consider doing steroids, uh, consider uh, uh, tocilizumab, anti-IL-6, consider using an anti-IL-1. So we thought, well, that reflects, it's, it's not really an intervention, but there was a protocol that was derived and instituted across the health system. So what we sought to do is find all patients with COVID-19 who were hospitalized, who had elevated levels of those inflammatory markers, trying to kind of emulate the doctor at the bedside, checking the inflammatory markers, and then looked at those people forward to see what their outcomes were based on what treatment they got. And we created buckets of treatment, one of which was standard of care, which was nothing, no steroids, no tocilizumab, nothing. And the other were variations of immunomodulators, immune treatments, steroids, tocilizumab, anakinra, et cetera. Actually, those are the three that I'm talking about, the immune modulators, right? The things that are meant to quell the immune system. And we look to see how did these people look different? What happened differently for them? Um, our modeling with our statistical colleagues took into consideration anything that seemed to be associated that could have changed that effect, cause and effect from the literature. And we tried to be very careful in controlling for anything that could be causing the effect other than the drugs. And what we found was standard of care did worse. They had worse mortality, hospital mortality. So standard of care in this case is getting no immune treatment, right? This is people who are in an inflammatory state, getting no immune system, did worse, had higher mortality than people who got any combination of immune modulator treatment. In particular, when we looked, it was tocilizumab and steroids that had the lowest mortality compared to standard of care and compared to any other immune system uh, treatment. So tocilizumab and steroid appeared to be better than just steroids alone even. Hmm. The reason I stress the standard of care is the clinical trials, the randomized controlled studies that have been done that came out around the date that our observational study was published. In their standard of care arm, they had steroids. Many patients had received steroids. So this is really, to my knowledge, the first large study that has a standard of care arm that got no steroids. What we're really talking about is, and you know, recovery had uh, similar, had steroids versus no steroids. This is tocilizumab, our study was tocilizumab, we had a group where we looked at tocilizumab and steroids versus nothing, and tocilizumab and steroids versus steroids. So it's not that we discovered that modulating the immune system is better than nothing, because the recovery trial really indicated that in those who have the most severe forms of COVID, i.e. they needed oxygen supplementation, that steroids was better than nothing, right? They, they 
brought light to that with a randomized controlled study. The curious finding in our study was that it appeared, again, this is an observation, it's not a randomized controlled study, but it appeared that when you add tocilizumab to steroids, that improved the mortality even more. And that's the area that needs to be further investigated. My understanding is there is a study currently underway looking at that question, uh, steroids and tocilizumab together. So hopefully we can, we can uh, find some answers to that with a randomized control study. And, and certainly clinically, I will say many of the clinicians, including myself on the front lines in, in, this, in the surge, had the impression that tocilizumab added to steroids when given early enough actually had an effect. Although we don't know because there was so much, you know, we're all prone to group think, everyone thinking like each other and seeing an association. I don't know, but I'll just tell you anecdotally, clinically, it fit what we were seeing. Now, doctor, we have found that during COVID-19, there appears to be a chasm between health systems and the clinic with research. We believe here at Trial Site News that real world data generated by health system studies, such as the retrospective study, can add medical value. Would you agree, or do you think that you will always need randomized controlled trials first above all else? You know, I wouldn't be a good scientist if I, if I, if I didn't think that the randomized control study was the best study. It is the best study, but I will say this. It too is at risk of being flawed. And just saying that something's a randomized control study, therefore it disproves something is a mistake. It depends on the size of the study and it very much depends on who is the, who is the patient population that's being studied. These RCTs that I referred to that were published around the time of our observational study were in patients who weren't as critically ill, who didn't require as high oxygen supplementation and who were not mechanically ventilated. So the results of their RCT as it relates to um, tocilizumab do not pertain to the most severely ill patient populations. I can't extrapolate from that study to critically ill patients. Also, when we design a randomized control study, we're trying to negate a null hypothesis, which I think is a term that people have kind of heard, which is basically you say, I want to prove against something. So most times it's proving against there being no effect. I wanna show that there actually is an effect of this drug on mortality. So I'm gonna prove, you know, disprove my null hypothesis of no effect. When you don't show that, the only thing that means is there is no evidence to show that this drug works. It does not mean there is evidence that the drug does not work. That's a subtle difference, but it's very important to understand. If there's a randomized controlled study that does not show a drug causes an effect, it does not mean the drug does not have an effect. What it means is, we don't have evidence that the drug has an effect. It's possible that with much larger sample sizes, and this is where the confidence interval comes into play in one of the New England Journal articles actually. One of the trials in New England Journal of Medicine actually talked about that confidence interval, that even though they weren't able to show an effect, the width of the confidence interval suggested that there might have been an effect, but that this study wasn't able to show it. Could very well be because of sample size, that if they have larger amounts of patients, we would be seeing an effect. And I feel that uh, at, at least the early glimpses of uh, the study that's ongoing right now with tocilizumab uh, is going to show an effect, but time will tell. So to answer your question, the randomized controlled study done right, i.e with the right selection of patient group, not being too heterogeneous, and with the right primary outcome, main outcome, right? And with the right sample size is the gold standard. It does show cause and effect as compared to the retrospective study that we did. The value of a retrospective study, the observational study that we did, is that it took a protocol, a natural, experiment of something that was happening 
and looked at the effect of that, you know, the, the clinician practice. It was a real world uh, ref reflection of real world behavior to look to see if there were outcomes. And it had an extremely large sample size. And there was another very large observational study that was published as well in another journal, similarly showing signal of effect. Now let's move on to the future then. What do you have planned for your next study or studies? Well, I'm, I'm engaged in a lot of COVID-19 research, uh, which I think is what you're asking me about. Yes. Uh, our, my, my focus really has become COVID-19 and I am singularly focused on helping improve outcomes for patients in a, in a very, driven, um, very driven way. For me, shedding light on this heterogeneity, heterogeneity is very important. Clinically, as an intensive care doctor, we saw that there were different types of people, that they weren't all the same types of people. And we saw on the floors as a pulmonologist with my infectious disease colleagues, uh, when we were doing clinical trials on the floor, that people were different. It mattered what your symptoms were. It mattered what day you were of the disease. So I'm, I'm very much focused right now on analyzing these differences, looking for heterogeneity, looking for what we call phenogroups. And we've just developed a 1900 person acute respiratory distress syndrome data set with COVID-19, the largest data set of COVID-19 ARDS, so that we can start to begin to understand differences. And that's a paper that we're about to submit for, for peer review. Oh, so fantastic. that'll be my avenue, looking at how are people different Questions like I mentioned before, why is it that black and brown people possibly are doing worse? Is it that they have other features of the disease that we aren't seeing to try to shed light on that? You're doing Yeoman's work and we're, uh, we're proud of the work you're doing over there. Thank you. Now, before I let you go today, is there anything else that you would like to share with our audience? As a physician scientist, I understand, and as a citizen, I understand that there is concern about scientific integrity, that there's concern about conflicting news. Uh, recently, I just heard the WHO is uh, advising against remdesivir when we had all these studies that says we should be using remdesivir. And early on in the course, as you remember, hydroxychloroquine was touted and everybody got hydroxychloroquine and then suddenly it doesn't work. So I can fully understand that as a citizen, as a person, you'd say, what the heck are the scientists doing, man? Do they know anything? Um, I urge to, I think I urge two things. One, uh, patience and uh, knowing that we are working around the clock, physicians and physician scientists in collaboration with colleagues from basic science and pharmaceutical industries and patients to figure it out. <laughs> and it's very important in science to say we were wrong. You should be able to say we were wrong. You should be able to take new data and say, guys, we were wrong. Now that we have new data, it shows that we weren't right. So we're gonna change our course. That's a very important part of science, although it's frustrating and we wanna have one answer. This disease hit us and we're all scrambling to find an answer. And so it's natural to have this natural evolution of what works and what doesn't work. And we should be allowed to update what we say. So I would, I would urge patience and I would also urge trust that most of the scientists who are working in this um, are of pure intent to find the truth and to find what works best because ultimately that also affects us and our families. So yes. I think those are the two messages that I, that I want to relay. Because I myself, I'm very frustrated when I just heard about the WHO today. I thought, what, you know, I always think, what are people going to think like, when they find out that we're reversing our core? Or yeah, at least the WHO is not supporting uh, what, what we've said. Yeah. Well, doctor, thank you so much for joining us today. We know you've got a busy schedule out there, and we appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. Thank you for helping voice science to, to, to people to understand. We appreciate it too. It's our pleasure.